Hi, my name is Edward Morgan. You're about to see a play I wrote with John Kishlein about the sinking of the Lady Elgin on Lake Michigan in 1860. This is a story about the collision of two ships. It's also a story about the collision of two men. It's also a snapshot of the psyche of America on the eve of civil war. Enjoy. The first thing I remember, as clear as if I'd just closed my eyes, is waking up with the air so foul in the back of my throat that I'm nearly choking. And my father running up and down, cursing and waving his arms, and the fields are black. The day before, green and lush, but in one night, all rotten. That was the blight of August 1846, and I was 12. I remember pulling a little wagon and the dust on the road with all the people and animals going to Galway. An old man fell down, and a woman went to help him, but I never saw if he got up. It scared me to see a man go down like that from starvation, because it was still the start of it, you know. But all of us on that road, we all kept saying the same thing. When we get to America, when we get to America, when we get to the green fields of America. 11 shillings each for passage to Liverpool. Four pounds ahead, Liverpool to New York. Took all my father's money. We were booked on board the Isabella. Well, not on it, down in it, in the cargo hold with the rest of the human cattle. 480 Irishmen doubling as ballast, naturally on an English ship. We had two privies, both stopped up within a week, no fresh air, no clean water, and food that was fit for goats and pigs. But we ate it, week after week, and the memory of rotten potatoes was buried in that stench. But to try and eat it and sleep in it, all of us seasick, lice-infested, racked with dysentery, pneumonia, or worse, 140 died like that, while the first-class passengers ate on linen tablecloths and strolled in the fresh sea air. But what of it? It's not like we were slaves they could sell for profit. Five weeks out, my mother puts my father's jacket on me as two sailors with rags over their mouths carried him up on deck, wrapped him in heavy sailcloth, tied him to a heavy block, and dropped him over the side. I watched my father sink into the cold gray water. No priest. The captain wore a white suit and read a psalm. Three weeks and two days later, my mother was buried the same way. And the next morning, there was a dark line on the horizon. The green fields of America. Tomsky just stared at me. Domsky is my editor. I am a reporter. My newspaper is the Atlas in Milwaukee. It is German. I am German. Domsky is German. He had just read the story I, Fritz Haas, had given him. He asked me to write a story on Captain Berry's funeral as a capstone on the sinking of the Lady Elgin. He said, I've had enough of this mess, Fritz. You write it. I wrote it. He read it and just stared at me. Then he tore it in half, saying, the Atlas won't print lies. We are for liberty and against all these sons of Patrick and soldiers of the Pope. Pride goeth before the fall. Well, they fell. You go to hell, Fritz. And give my regards to Captain Barry. That's what he said, my editor. Bomsky and I came here 11 years ago. Born in the old world, come to seek a better life in this one. They call us 48ers because that's when we came to the United States instead of crawling back into Germany. Our politics were too complicated for the Prussian army. Domsky had a name and a family which preceded him. I didn't. They gave him a newspaper. He gave me a job. But this is the story I wrote that Domsky tore in half.
November 11th, 1860. Captain Barry's funeral yesterday brought the city to a standstill as a great crowd moved from funeral to grave. So many have suffered some loss in the wreck of the Lady Elgin, and the fresh graves of Captain Barry and his son lie at the center of that grief. It seems impossible to know how to proceed with the life of the city after such a blow to its heart. The shock from the collision has not subsided. And yet, less than a week ago, the grieving Irish were roused from their early morning rest by songs and shouts of triumph as the Republicans celebrated Mr. Lincoln's victory with a cannon. The cannon did not comfort the Irish, though. It could not wake the dead. I used to sleep so soundly. After prayers, my mother would tuck the blankets around me like a nest. She'd blow out the lamp, and in the morning, I'd wake without having moved. These days, I lie awake, reliving the events of September the 8th a hundred times a night. I wake so tired, sometimes I hardly know myself. The only place I feel at home is on the water. I always have. I spent half the summer of my 17th year on a schooner. My uncle was first mate and persuaded my father to let me sail. She was an old two-masted lumber hooker, the Fred Bill. And from the moment I stepped on board, I was in heaven. What does it mean to reef the mizzen? How do you tie a running bowline? When can I climb up and sit in the cross trees? I was clumsy and stupid, but willing. And her captain took a liking to me. He asked me to stay on through the season, but my father insisted that I come home to my studies and church and our cause. His cause. Of course, he's in the right, but after a while, you get tired of having a cause. At 16, after four years in a charming New York orphanage, I was free. Philadelphia, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago, I drifted from one to the next, a week, a month, a year, and every city had its downtrodden Irish. Looking for work, Paddy? No Irish need apply. Why don't you go back to your bogs, you stinking mick? Nativism. That's what they call it, because they're native born and we're not. That's justification for hating a man. The worst are the know-nothings with their white hats saying they know nothing about who's a member and who's not, or what they've done to some poor immigrant bastard. Ah, but the inferiority of the Irish is scientific fact. One in 10 is born with a tail. But if we want to make sense of this tragedy, we must follow a chain of events that leads back not to a son of Erin, but to a son of Africa. In 1854, an escaped slave, Joshua Glover, was found by U.S. Marshals in Racine, beaten, arrested, and conveyed to the Milwaukee jail. The next day, a large protest was held outside the jail. The crowd freed Glover by force, and he was smuggled on board a ship to Canada and freedom. Sherman Booth, the infamous editor of the Free Democrat, had drummed up the protest and was arrested for violating the Fugitive Slave Act. These marshals are agents of the Southern planters, Booth shouted. But rather than see one runaway slave in their clutches, I would have every last marshal hanged from a gallows. Mr. Booth has a flair for the dramatic. But he is a great reformer. I once heard his deep voice thundering from the podium for the abolition of alcohol. I raised a stein of lager in tribute. He's a minister my father, but his cause is abolition. Years ago, he began to shelter runaways in the cellar of the church. When some of his congregation objected, he rebuked them from the pulpit. He preaches and marches and writes against it. He sailed to Milwaukee with the men who stormed the jail and freed Joshua Glover, and when he got back, he rang the church bell in celebration. He's a man of conviction, 
my father. And of course, he had a plan for me. I was to travel west to settle among the free soilers in the Kansas Territory, to hold the line against slavery's advance. And I know it's important, I do, but after that summer of sailing, I just couldn't go. It wasn't a lack of courage, and it's not that I didn't want Kansas free, I just didn't want to go there. I wanted to be on the lake. I wanted to sail. So I disobeyed him and signed on as an ordinary seaman. <laughs> I thought he might disown me, but he didn't. And he thought I might forget my faith, but I didn't. I carried my Bible with me, and somehow I even kept it dry. This journal was given to me, Ellen Delaney, by my great friend, Eliza Curtin, on the occasion of my 18th birthday, July 23rd, 1860. And in it, I shall keep a record of my days. I live at 158 Jefferson Street in the third ward in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with my parents, Thomas and Kathleen Delaney. And I was born there along with my sisters, Monica, Kate, and Moira, and my brothers, Thomas, William, and Patrick. My parents came from the town of Kinsale in County Cork in 1841, and I was conceived somewhere between New York and Buffalo. <laughs> Being the oldest child, I work at the Burns Hotel and have been there for two years now, having started in scullery. My bosses treat me well, for the most part, but I have such hopes. I think it is fortune's good sign that Eliza gave me this journal just now. Each night, I give over to sleep with a thousand new ideas and things to remember. Getting to write them here in these pages will give me a chance to see these new currents in my life. For in the happening, they say, we rarely know when our course has changed or what riches pass us by. I want to understand it all, and I'm lucky to have such a friend to give me this journal. Soon after his arrest, Sherman Booth was freed by the Wisconsin Supreme Court, who ruled the Fugitive Slave Act unconstitutional. Naturally, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that decision invalid. The Chief Justice is a former slave owner. But the Wisconsin Court refused to recognize that decision. The two great courts banged heads like mountain goats, and Mr. Booth was repeatedly arrested and released. The storm over slavery had come to Wisconsin. I arrived in Milwaukee on a cool October day at 20 years of age. Took a wagon from Chicago with a name in my pocket of a man who was hiring Drayman. Found my way to the Irish ward, the bloody third, muddiest streets in town. I got myself a drink at a tavern and I stood in the corner and they were giving me stares, but nobody spoke. Then two young fellas started fighting and just like that, the room was full of shouting. The door opens, and men turn, and it's like a chill blows through the room, like a hush. You could hear the fighters grunting and cursing on the sawdust floor, by now one's banging the other's head against the leg of a stool, and there's blood in the sawdust. The man at the door steps all the way in, dark-haired and dark-eyed, with a brow like a dome, and his back as straight as a ramrod. He grabs the hair of the top one and pulls him up, the man growls and swings round, but when he sees who it is, he shuts his mouth like a startled sheep. Your man says, that's enough, and off the fighter goes out the door. Then someone helps the bloody one up, and the dark man stands up straight and sweeps the room with his glare, and everyone goes muttering into their drinks. He spoiled the fun. Then the dark man starts toward me, and I think, look out, O'Brien, you're on his turf. But he nods and looks me over and starts asking me questions. Who are you? Where was your family from? When did you come over? And who do you know? So I answer, one, two, three, down the line, until finally he says, so, Mr. O'Brien, what is it you're looking for? Well, a decent job for a couple of months, you know. Maybe a girl or two or three. I haven't found a reason to want much else. And I give a little laugh like it's a smart thing to say. But then he fixed those dark eyes on me and he said, how hard have you looked? That man was Garrett Barry. 
To one who's never sailed, it is impossible to describe. I don't mean on a steamer. I mean a wooden ship with canvas spread before the wind. I mean feeling her pitch and roll like a living thing beneath you, or watching the sun rise out of the lake, or standing on deck at night. Yes, I romanticize it. Loading grain hoppers, stacking lumber, shoveling coal, hauling lines, patching, scrubbing, painting, climbing the shrouds in bitter cold, being tossed on gale force winds, one slip from drowning, with no home or comfort but a creaking, crowded, stinking, leaky forecastle. What kind of fool longs for that? Yet to me, life on the water is more honest and alive. You strip down to the essentials, the sky, the wind, the water, and work. A lot of sailors feel the same. We took to the water to be free. With a word from Garrett Barry, I had work as a bricklayer's helper and a room in a boarding house up on the bluffs, and I was welcome under any roof in the third ward, just like that. And with my first month's wages of $16.40, I bought my uniform and boots and Captain Barry swore me in as Private James O'Brien of the Union Guard. Just like that. July 26th. This morning at the hotel was another whirlwind. The ships come in each day with new immigrants and seekers of fortune. Annie Kennedy and I ran the stairs a hundred times in the heat and were soaked through by noon. I had to go home and change. Later on, the desk man, Joe, said he was going to jump on the first steamer out of here, but of course he won't. He'll go home to be with his mother on Water Street. But Joe also said that his friend, Andy Monahan, was going to ask me to go to Chicago with him. Well, with him and Captain Garrett Barry and a few hundred other people. It's the excursion to raise money for the Union Guards. And Joe says Andy wants me to come along. I've sailed on half a dozen schooners up and down the lakes with every kind of cargo. Grains and timber, iron and copper, fish, furs, salt, general merchandise and supplies, passengers, livestock, and even poultry. Our cook on that poultry run, her name was Marta, and she had a keen nose. Every morning she'd wake up and say the same thing. A ship full of chickens is a mighty foul vessel. July 30th. The heat was worse, and there was great lightning and thunder, so the hotel was full of steaming guests pestering me and wanting things. Near noon, I went outside to get some air and was hit by the wind and the hard rain. There was a loud crack of thunder and a great flash, and I laughed out loud. Two men looked at me, and I laughed again. Then I went back to running the stairs. When I got home, I told Mother about it, and Moira giggled till Mother gave her the eye. But Joe was right. That afternoon, Andy asked me to go to Chicago with him. Oh, I hope I can. Garrett Barry had steel in him. He had done things, you know, accomplished things, and he chose to be Irish. I mean, he was born in America and had a proper upbringing, but he chose to be one of us. And that, steel, you know, that's what he expected, not just from us Union Guard, from every bloody Irishman in the country. August 1st, I have gotten off work for the excursion in September. Eliza and Mary Tevlin have their tickets already, but now my parents disapprove. It's too soon, I'm too young, it's not safe. Father says it's mother's decision. How can I convince her? I sailed out to the Atlantic Ocean once and all the way down to Baltimore, and I was excited to see the coast and sail on salt water but Baltimore was so full of slaves, and they were so degraded, it sickened me. I stayed on board for three days. I didn't feel myself again until we were halfway to Halifax. But that was two years ago, before I'd ever heard of the Augusta or the Lady Elgin. August 4th. Mother has decided I cannot go. I'm 18 years old. It's not fair. She has no right. Sometimes I wish we weren't Irish. You have to understand, 
Before Garrett Barry, the militia was nothing. Social clubs with organ grinder monkey suits. They fired off a musket now and then, marched a few parades. He was a West Point officer. He'd fought in two wars. And if he was going to be a militia commander, then by God, his men would be soldiers. Manual of arms, column and file, cadence and route steps, counter-marching, battle tactics. We studied and drilled and marched in fear of his temper as much as anything. But we were Barry's guards, the marching Irishmen. They gave us banquets in Buffalo, Detroit, Chicago. And he was a man of standing, you know. He had businesses and properties. And when he was voted county treasurer, people started saying he should run for governor. The tug of war over Sherman Booth was big news in Wisconsin, and Alexander Randall rode that story all the way to Madison, our first Republican governor. And isn't he a fine piece of work? A jaunty New York lawyer, a Methodist abolitionist who drinks, plays cards, and wears a bad toupee. He's Domsky's man. It's true he called for the Negro right to vote 14 years ago, but he has also presided over the demolition of the state's economy while he and his speculator friends ride their railroads to the bank. August 14th, they have relented. I can go, I can go. Mrs. Tevlin agreed to chaperone, so mother finally changed her mind. I am so happy, I cannot wait to tell Eliza. Now these pages will be crowded with my life. Some two months ago, on the last day of August, I arrived in Detroit on the Rapid. She was trim, and her crew was likable enough, but her captain drinks, and when he drinks, he grows surly, so that evening I jumped ship. A lakeman can always look for a better berth. I had a full night's sleep in a rooming house on a big, dry feather bed, it didn't even bother me having to share it with a snoring mule driver who stumbled in at midnight and slept in his boots. Still a better night than I'm accustomed to. In the morning, I went to the docks. A sturdy two-masted schooner had just unloaded a cargo of salt. Her crew was washing her down, and a tall young man stood on the gangplank watching, so I asked him about the ship. The Augusta, he said. The owners are coming to inspect her and his accent was English, or Canadian, as it turned out. Need any able-bodied hands? Two, he said. We're running lumber to Chicago. Who's the captain? As of today, he said, I am. At the moment, I am drunk, but not without cause. I'm celebrating. As a matter of fact, I may extend the celebration till the day after tomorrow. He looked to be about 21, but Captain Darius Mallet had just sailed back from England, and the Augusta's owners had signed him for the remainder of the season. You see, I just received my commission as second lieutenant, Milwaukee's Union Guard, 1st Brigade, 1st Division, under Captain Garrett Barry. I'm proud of myself for once. Mallet hired me on the spot along with an Irishman named Horrigan, and that made for a full crew of seven. We loaded up with Michigan pine, and on September the 1st, at 4 a.m., we set sail in a light rain with a southerly breeze bound for Chicago. August 22nd, I am holding my ticket. Round trip for a dollar, special excursion rate to Chicago and back, and it's the Lady Elgin. So we'll be traveling in style, as they say, on the Queen of the Lakes. Andy says they've sold hundreds of tickets. I can hardly wait. Only 15 days till September the 7th. When Barry says march, you march. And when he says vote, you vote. Democrat. These new Republicans keep trying to win us over, saying Democrats are slaveocrats. And sure, there's no love lost between the blacks and the Irish. But they're free here, and they mind their own business better than any fish-stinking Norwegians. Look, if a black escapes to Wisconsin, it's dandy with us if he's free. But Randall and his judges think they can thumb their noses at Washington, and the laws laid down by the Supreme Court. 
And now they've come to such contention over one fugitive slave and one loudmouth abolitionist that some of these legislators have puffed up their chests and called for secession. That's right. They want us to leave the Union and declare war on the United States. In March of this year, Sherman Booth was once again arrested. Certain members of the legislature responded by proposing a resolution to put the state's militias on a war footing and declare war on the United States. The resolution was dismissed, but Governor Randall was not satisfied. The next day, a man was sent from his office to question the loyalties of Captain Garrett Berry and his men. What would you do, Mr. Berry, if Wisconsin were to break with the Union and the governor called you up to fight? That's what they asked Captain Garrett Berry. Imagine the glare he gave them. If such an order were to come, he said, it would be illegal, and any man who obeyed it could be hung or imprisoned and his citizenship forfeit. The Union Guards are patriots and will give no aid or comfort to any treason against our country. Two days later, Governor Rendell revoked Captain Berry's commission, disbanded the Union Guards, and ordered all their arms returned to Madison. It's unbelievable! Unbelievable! This was scandal, and the newspapers feasted on it. Dirty politics, that's what it is. Governor Randall and Captain Barry exchanged heated letters, and Barry sent them to every newspaper in the state to be published and argued over. Was Randall a tyrant abusing his office, or was Barry insubordinate? It's a trick to take down Barry and put us back in our place. That's what it is. It remains unclear whether any other militias were put to the same test, because the Germans would likely have been split. The only thing we Germans agree on is a good schnapps. When Barry came into our meeting that night, every man was present. What does it mean, shouted Peter Riley. Are we finished? Barry raised his hand, and the room went silent. Listen to me, he said. I didn't live through the Battle of Monterey to be knocked down by some jack-legged lawyer from Madison. And he was shaking. He was that angry. We're the Union Guard, and we'll guard the Union, whatever comes of it. We own our own uniforms. We've the right to bear arms. We'll find our own guns, and we'll carry on as a citizen's militia. And 70 Irishmen stood up. It was Barry against Randall. Loyalty to the Union versus a hard stand against slavery. The Irish soldier and the Yankee lawyer both standing on principle, both staying the course. September the 7th, 1860. This is the best day of my life. I sit on the deck of the Lady Elgin. It's late. The air is heavy with fog, a great party as Captain Wilson waits for us to assemble for our voyage to Chicago. Everyone seems to be on this trip. And in order to keep a record of the occasion, I have tried to write everyone down while they're still fresh in my mind. I start, of course, with Eliza Curtin, Mary Tevlin, and Mrs. Tevlin. Eliza, Mary, and I are getting along so well. We're like three sisters. Already we've begun planning a return trip for the spring. But who else? Of course, there's Captain Garrett Barry. He stood on deck and greeted us very politely as we came on board. He also brought his young son along. The boy looked so proud. Oh, and there's Andy. Andy Monahan. He looks quite dashing in his uniform. With fair weather, it's a good seven days from Detroit to Chicago, and that's what it took us on the Augusta. But looking back now, several incidents come to mind. Our first night out, I had the wheel, and Captain Mallet said, hold this course until eight bells. And Vorse and Budge, our first and second mates, both burst out laughing. Begging your pardon, Captain, said Vorse, but Lakemen go by the clock. Of course, Mallet knew that, but he'd been on the seas so much he'd forgotten, said eight bells instead of 12 o'clock. He shrugged off their laughter, and, but they kept it up until he lost his good humor and went below. It occurred to me then that maybe it galled them having such a young man as captain, and maybe that mattered later on. The O'Grady's have come, and the Sheehan family and their little boy, he is a holy terror. And Mrs. Sheehan already looks worn out. 
and Mr. J.M. is already drunk. In the following months, the Republican Party met in Chicago and nominated for the presidency a little-known rail splitter from Illinois by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Fortunately for him, the Democratic Party was a house divided. Domsky thought Lincoln was too tame. Domsky wanted fire. So did Randall. So did Booth. They say you can fire a Springfield rifle three times in a minute. Well, a congressman has found our new guns, and they're Springfields. None of your old muskets. They're muzzle loaders with percussion caps. Oh, we have to pay for them, of course. But we'll find a way. Oh, and won't His Royal Highness Randall be delighted when we're the best armed company in the state? The Cody sisters came after all, so that's been enjoyable. And there's a half dozen O'Briens, and the Burks, and the Rooneys, and Mr. and Mrs. O'Hearn, and his poor, miserable sister, and father's old friend, John Horan, and Ellen Sullivan, and five Murphys, including the one with the very large wart. Eliza made a horrible joke, and I had to turn away to keep from bursting into laughter. A great many were sympathetic to the Union Guard, so when they got up an excursion to the Democratic rally in Chicago to raise funds to buy their own weapons, the event was heavily subscribed. There are important people, too, besides Captain Barry. There's City Councilor McCormick and the Harbor Master, Alderman Crilly, Chief Eviston and a dozen firemen, Constables Fahey and Burns. Oh, and Mary Crean, who, as Eliza remarked, has gotten much bigger lately in certain places. The largely German city band decided to go, as well as many members of the German militias, the Black Jaegers and the Green Jaegers. And not all were Democrats, but they went in support of the Irish. I planned to go. From the German angle, I saw a good story. But Domsky refused to send a reporter on a papist joyride. He is a fool, and I am still alive. What do I owe him for that? There are many others, of course, but that's everyone I know that I can remember now. Oh, I should also mention the city band, and most of Barry's guards, of course. But I already mentioned a few of them, like Andy Monahan, who just came back on deck. And Eliza is pointing at him. Oh, I can feel myself turning pink with embarrassment. I think he's looking at me. He is looking at me, staring. We were just above Saginaw Bay. It was afternoon and we were on watch, Budge, Horrigan and me. I was at the wheel and Budge took Horrigan aloft to tighten the shrouds and secure the four-stay tackle that had come loose. Budge was the last to come down, I'm sure of that. But later on, after supper, the block fell to the deck three feet from William Bonner. It might have split his skull. Budge lit into Horrigan, blaming and cursing him for a stupid, lazy patty. And Horrigan never said a word. It was Budge's fault, and he knew it, and we knew it. But Horrigan was Irish, and Budge was an officer. The Elgin was the queen of the lakes, a double-deck side-wheeled steamer 250 feet long and a 1,000 tons. I sailed on her years ago to Cleveland. She was quite comfortable. Jack Wilson was her captain, a master sailor and a fine man. The Lady Elgin is a wonder. She carries hundreds with ease as well as the cargo. Her two paddle wheels are as tall as a house and push us through the water at a fast gallop. Her cabins and salons are appointed with beautiful cloths and fine leathers, and her woodwork is all deep colors and finishes that would put a fine hotel to shame, much less my little place of employment. Her highest deck, they call it a hurricane deck. It affords quite a view if you can brave the wind. Mother and father would be enchanted. But truth be told, I'm glad they're not here. This is my first time to Chicago and my first trip alone without them. And finally, after months of talking and organizing and hours of delay on Dousman's dock, the bells rang and the great wheels began to turn and off we went. 
The voyage down was wonderful. Ah, oh, the trip down was a grand Milwaukee party. The boat was lit up like a palace. Eliza, Mary and I danced and talked and laughed all night. We barely shut our eyes. I felt quite grown up. Bands played, couples danced in the ballroom. The barmen raked it in hand over fist. Only the old people gave up and slept. The weather was fair as we came through the Straits of Mackinac. I was lookout on the bow, and Captain Mallet came forward and engaged me in conversation. So I asked him how it was that he made Captain so young. I'm not so young, he said. I'm 26. I signed on with the Gold Hunter the day I turned 18. She was headed for England, and I wanted to see the world. Did you? Well, yes and no. We hit a gale, and the cargo shifted, and she rolled on her side, dismasted. The captain drowned, and our food was underwater. We floated like that for three weeks, until the rest of the crew took hold of me and George Dormer, and told us that since we were the youngest and hadn't any wives, we'd have to draw straws, and the loser would be eaten. I got the long one. Did they eat him, I asked? Partly, he said. We were rescued, and I went home and got married right away. Then I stayed home a while, out of guilt. Well, ignorance, really. Why ignorance? Why was I guilty? For having the luck to draw a long straw? For not being eaten? No. It was for being powerless to keep a thing like that from happening. You feel you ought to be able to set things right, to change the way of the world, but you can't. We arrived at dawn, with the red sun rising huge out of the lake. An Irish delegation met us at the Clark Street Wharf and took us to breakfast. Then we headed off to see the city of Chicago. We know well the events in Chicago, much reported in the aftermath. But so many noted Captain Barry and his Union guards marching in the streets, performing the fine maneuvers he had taught them, receiving great applause from crowded sidewalks. They all mentioned that. And after the parade, when Stephen Douglas mentioned us from the podium, a thousand people cheered. September 7th. I think this is a special time for me, for us. Great things are happening, and Chicago is a wondrous city that makes your blood run faster. Milwaukee is never this loud, and people here carry on. They call and yell in the streets and taverns and take such pride in it. At the banquet that night, we toasted Barry and St. Patrick and the little giant, and we booed Randall and Lincoln and all the Republicans. Douglas will be president. The Union will be preserved. And when Randall's term is up, it's Barry for governor. After the rally, Eliza, Mary, and I headed north on Clark Street when a great noise rolled out upon us. Daly's Town Tavern was on the left, and we smelled it before we saw it. Men were shouting about the election, which was certainly the order of the whole day. The two men coming out of Daly's were polite, though, and weren't foolish from drinking. They tipped their hats and said pleasant things to us, especially Eliza. One of them smiled with his mouth while his eyes spoke different. Eliza saw it, too. Then they stepped off the boards, bellowing on in the dust, arguing politics. Then I said, Mary, how would you vote if you had the chance? She looked at me funny. Since when can ladies vote? Well, if you could, I said. Democrat, of course. Then Eliza said, and you, Miss Delaney, how would you vote if you had the chance? Well, I said, Mr. Douglas is willing to let each state decide for itself. But I serve people, and I think servants should be paid, not owned. But they're not servants, said Mary, they're slaves. Well, said Eliza, I think Mr. Lincoln has a great big donkey face. We all laughed and walked on. We docked in Muskegon early on the 7th. We were to pick up a load of shingles, so we stacked more lumber on deck to make room in the hold. She was top heavy and overloaded, but the more you carry, the better it pays. Everyone does it. I know what Father Donahue told us. 
but someone I cannot name has lent me a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and a few weeks ago, I read it. Miss Stowe is a great writer, and when Uncle Tom died after Simon Legree whipped him, well, if Eliza and Mary had read that book, they would understand about slavery. We were down in the galley for coffee, and the talk turned to politics. Vorse got very loud and said, now mark me, sooner or later there's going to be war, and who's to blame? The goddamn abolitionists. That's wrong, I said. The blame lies in the institution and not the men who strive to tear it down. And it was my father's voice. Vorse looked at me funny. Who are you now, young Mr. Terrett, the next John Brown? No, sir, I said. No, I am not, but I don't favor slavery. Well, I do, said Budge, for all the blacks and all the bog-stinking Irish. And he and Vorse laughed and laughed, and Horrigan walked out. I thought him cowardly. I wanted him to do something. I wanted someone to answer, but Captain Mallet looked at Vorse and Budge, then looked at me and shook his head. Four wooden crates were waiting at the wharf. Captain Barry prayed the lid off one and lifted out a Springfield rifle. He raised the gun and looked down the sights, and the barrel gleamed in the lantern light. See any Republicans, I said, and everyone laughed. But he brought the gun down, and he looked at me, and his black eyes were dead serious. Because he'd fought in wars, you know, and it wasn't a lark to him. I mean, he wasn't afraid to put his life on the line, but it wasn't a lark. We crossed the lake, and by early evening, we saw Milwaukee's lights. We came about and headed south by east under full sail with the northeast wind behind us. We had the graveyard watch, Horrigan, Budge, and me, so we went below and slept while we could. But the Augusta's pilot light was already lit. I saw Vorse lighted. By 10 o'clock, the Elgin was a madhouse. They were driving 60 cows into the hold below to ship up north, and they were bellowing like a slaughterhouse. A storm was moving in, but I think it wasn't that that held us up as much as Captain Wilson being unable to get the local revelers off his boat. Who cared? The music was playing, and we were on top of the world. It's after 11 here. People are milling about all over the ship. There's been a great deal of shouting. Someone is announcing another dance. Andy Bonahan just came back into the parlor. He's weaving. He's had too much. He's such a boy. You'd think by now. I'll bet he's never read a whole book in his life. The captain rang the bell, the crew cast off lines, the paddle wheels began to turn. And just after 11.30 p.m., the steamer left the dock. The estimate is that 450 were aboard. We picked up speed and headed out of the river into the lake. The bells chimed midnight. At midnight, I took the wheel, Horgan took the bow lookout, and Budge sat in the pilot house as usual. The wind picked up. Some ladies gave a concert in the aft cabin, but I stayed in the salon to write in my journal. At 1 a.m., Captain Mallet came on deck to check the weather. The wind was rising, but he was satisfied. Mary and Mrs. Tevlin said goodnight and went below. Eliza and I sat up with the Cody girls, and I told them the entire story of Uncle Tom's cabin. By 2 o'clock, we were past Waukegan, still headed south by east. The waves were choppy, and the sky was clouded, and Horrigan came aft and said, I think there's a light ahead. Budge went forward to look. It was after two, I think. I was dozing in a chair in the salon when I heard loud voices outside. Budge came back, and he'd seen the light too, but couldn't tell its direction. Should we change course, I asked, or wake the captain? Wait a bit, he said, and went back forward. At 2.15 a.m., the steamer was ten miles off Winnetka when a storm struck. The schooner Augusta appeared a short time later. 226 tons hurtling south by east before the wind. Ten minutes later, Budge went down for the captain. Right then, a squall line struck with sheets of rain. Then a violent gust threw us over on our beam end, and that caused the lumber on deck to shift. 
And just like that, there were volumes of water washing over the rail. I was scared we were going to roll. We went out on deck, and the wind and rain hit my face. Eliza said they saw lights. Then she put her hand to her mouth and called, that way. Mallet hurried up with all hands. The water was knee deep on the port side. They struck the mainsail and reefed the fore, and she righted a little. They were climbing over the lumber to get to the jibs when Mallet saw the light, maybe a quarter mile ahead. It was the steamer heading across our bow. A bolt of lightning lit the sky, and Eliza was right. There was a ship. He screamed at me, hard up for God's sake, man, hard up. And I tried to pull her up, but she wouldn't move. He scrambled back and grabbed the wheel, and we both tried, but the wind was too much, and the lopsided weight, we couldn't turn. We ran back inside to keep dry. The next three minutes felt like an hour. Captain Mallet shouting orders, water coursing down the deck, Horrigan waving frantically, a lightning flash on the big paddle wheel. It's like a story someone already told me, and I know the ending, but I can't stop it. It's sometime after two. We've been driven below by the rain, and I'm having a late drink with Lacey the barman and a Chicago man named Jotham. Well, actually, it's a very early drink. And Lacey's telling us the comical tale of when the Elgin was out on Lake Erie with a touring circus menagerie below. Port helm, cries the captain. But the wheelsman can't do it, and the boat starts going round. Port helm, for God's sake, can't you see where we're going? But for the life of him, the poor wheelsman can't budge the wheel an inch. Finally, the captain shoves the man aside and takes the wheel himself, but he can't move it either. And the boat's just going round and round in the middle of the lake. So they cut the engines, and a bunch of them go below to see what's wrong. And there's Mr. Siam, the elephant in the menagerie. And he's reached up and grabbed the steering chains with his trunk to keep them from rattling. An elephant is all it was, says Lacey. And he reaches out to refill my glass. On a rising wave, we ram her. All of a sudden, there's a jolt, and we're nearly thrown to the floor. The glass falls and shatters. I fall forward across the room into the bench on the far wall. A great crushing, ripping sound, and the lights go out. And Lacey looks at me and says, that's bad. I clutch the wheel as the next wave drives our jib boom deeper in and then back. Dishes and pans from the steamer's galley tumble out and clatter across our deck. Everything's tilting to the left. The steamer pulls around and we're dragged abreast. I hurry up on deck into the storm. And there's a boat, and she's hit us. A dozen men are looking down on us. Her crew is standing there, open-mouthed, or yelling, I can't hear in the wind. We couldn't pull up. One of them raises his hands like that, as if to say, what's happened? Throw us a line. He shouts again, and we pull away. And we fall back into a trough as the steamer churns ahead with all our headgear and jib boom and all. People are coming upstairs, asking what's happened. Is it serious? I don't know. She's heading away, her engines thumping north by northeast. She's on her previous course. A man grabs my arm. They've knocked a hole below the waterline. We've got to plug it up. A crewman says, stay here, and he runs below. We try to follow him to check on Mary, but we keep running into people. I follow below, and there's water coursing down the passageway. Eliza, she must have gone back up. The captain's in the boiler room with the coal gang, but they can't stop the water rushing in. It's too strong. The crew is rousing the passengers. I'm near Mary's room, so I start banging on doors. A man shouts, drives the cattle overboard to lighten the ship. Mrs. Tevlin answers the door, still half asleep. Mary, I say, wake up. There's been a collision. I reach the deck, and the whistle's screaming, the bell's ringing. But there's no sign of any ship. And Mary starts screaming. We're sinking, we're sinking. I try to embrace her, to draw her to me, to calm her. But then a man's strong grip pulls us out the doorway and along the dark passage. They lower a boat to try and plug the hole with mattresses. But it's swept away. Here's the stairs, he says. Up you go and find a life plank. Come starboard, they're shouting, to raise the hole above water. But no one's listening. A what? A life plank. 
A piece of wood with a rope through it, starboard aft. It's all confusion. We climb on deck with Mary crying, Mrs. Tevlin asking everyone questions. I'm trying to find a life plank. Where is Eliza? Where is she? Oh, Jesus. The engine stopped. The whistle stopped. There's no more steam. They're flooded. We're stopped. They're tearing the doors off of hinges. They're chopping away at the hurricane deck. The firemen, to keep the deck from sinking with the ship. We're going to sink. She was on her previous course, into the wind, and that's the last we saw of her. We thought she was hit above the water line, and we were the ones about to sink. Vorse kept saying it was hard of them to leave us like that. The Lady Elgin was built with one big hold, so when the hull was breached, there was no way to prevent the hold from rapidly filling. The engines died in minutes. The worst thing is we could have taken so many, all of them maybe, if we'd known, if someone had thrown us a line. But our voices were lost in the wind. I'm holding Mary tight because she's hysterical. We're crowded aft, 200 or more of us. A Union Guardsman offers help. That lunatic's still ringing the bell. A young lady's praying. A man tells a Guardsman to throw away his knapsack so he can swim. There's no one out there. Captain Barry shouts, hold on to the railing. And the stern begins to go. It's folding in the middle. A wave hits the smokestacks. A man jumps into the waves holding a door and his child. They tumble across each other. The smokestack falls across the deck. It's crushing a woman. There's a roar and shrieks and wails. And Mary grabs me. And I'm trying to grip the rail as the deck rips free and it all goes down like a house tumbling. And all the lights go out with a terrible hiss. The cries of children for their parents. Names in the dark. The Elgin's gone. Mother, father. We're in the water. We struck all sails while Captain Mallet sent Morris, the cook, below to check the hull. We cut away an anchor, and he ordered the lifeboat ready, but Morris came back up and said, there's leaks, but no breach in the hull. We could hardly believe it, no breach in the hull. Still, the forestays were gone. We had to be careful not to lose the mast, so we hauled up the forestaysail, then turned her back before the wind and stood in for land. Hundreds now floated on the cutaway deck and planks of wood, scattered southwest by the wind towards the distant shore. Still alive. It's cold and dark. We're on a piece of deck, about a hundred of us, and Captain Wilson and Captain Barry and his son. The waves keep crashing over us. The water's warm, but the wind is cold. I thrashed my way onto a big flat board, and it's the piano. I'm on top of the ship's piano. Another man's climbed on as well. We're perched here, braced against each other back to back. It's almost comical if we weren't so desperate. I can barely swim. Poor Mary's huddled and shivering as her mother tries to comfort her. Our dresses and petticoats are soaked and so heavy, all the layers. We're in for a long night. Play the piano by any chance? No answer. I think he's injured. When lightning flashes, I see people everywhere in the water, waving arms, upturned faces, and another great raft like our own. I hear a voice I know. It's Garrett Barry. Captain Barry, it's O'Brien. Well done, Jimmy. Keep your spirits up. We'll make it yet. We'll make it. I'm keeping my spirits up. Captain Wilson has told the men to hold up doors and coats as sails to help push us towards the shore. I'm doing as I can. I'm holding up a piece of cloth. But my teeth have begun to chatter and they won't stop. Mr. Horan, John Horan crawls over to me and he's taking off his big coat. Now put this on, go on, that's right. It's warm and still partly dry. Thank you, sir. He's a big man. 
like my father. Well done, Jimmy. Keep your spirits up. I think of St. Teresa. She had a sense of humor and she liked to dance. And she scolded her priest once, and even God. She fell off a footbridge into a creek, and when she came up all wet, that's when she scolded God. If this is how you treat your friends, she said, no wonder you have so few of them. But God forgave her, and she joined the communion of saints. Daylight. Daylight. Still drifting, me and my piano. There's fog on the water. The wind won't stop. The decks have broken into pieces. Mary and Mrs. Tevlin are gone. He's washed off. The other man never spoke. Maybe they're on another piece of raft. The rain stopped. Captain Wilson rallies us on. He's done so all night. The waves are littered with bodies and broken timbers. I saw a colored man, seasick, clinging to a dead cow. And pieces of railing, and kegs and boxes. He sank away. Cattle crates and busted chairs. I saw the drummer boy float by on his bass drum. And bottles and apples. He waved. A suitcase, a lampshade, a cabbage, a guitar. I don't see Mr. Horan. I have his coat. My hands are numb. We can see trees now and the shore. They're not even hands anymore. They're so numb. They're like big dead fish. We'll be saved. A wave pushes me off. Not even a strong one. But I can't hang on anymore with these useless hands. And I can't swim back. We're going to live. I'm looking down underwater. I see a crate of rifles slowly sinking down. And there's a figure wrapped in sailcloth like my father. And an old man falling on a dusty road. And there's Garrett Barry's proud head glistening wet. And in the distance, a gray morning. And a thin, dark line on the horizon. We had a long, sodden night. And the wind kept on, 300 miles of lake behind it. But every one of us said prayers of thanks to God and to the men who made the Augusta's hull so strong. When I get back to Oswego, said Budge, I'll kiss those shipwrights. By eight in the morning, the shore was lined with people. Farmers, townsfolk, students from the local college. They had been alerted by the Elgin's clerk who had made shore in the lifeboat that was carried away from the ship. The wind pushes us towards the shore. There are bluffs ahead and high waves breaking. Captain Wilson shouts, hold on when we reach the breakers. Hold on. He's holding a baby. I am numb. The passengers struggling in the waves could be seen for miles with those near shore calling for help. The raft is breaking in the surf. A wave washes Captain Wilson off. But the turbulent breakers at the foot of the steep high bank made help nearly impossible. Captain Barry swept away with one arm reaching up. A hundred died within yards of the shore, pummeled or drowned in the undertow. The raft breaks up. I'm in the water. Someone grabs me, shouting. There's rope around his waist. He's pulling me to shore. He's saving me. I stumble out of the water. I'm saved. I'm saved. At 2.30 in the morning in Milwaukee, Chief of Police Beck woke out of a sound sleep with a great feeling of dread. He dressed quickly and went to police headquarters to see if something was wrong. The wind gusted and the trees and fences had been blown down, but he found no emergency. 
The chief went to stations in almost every ward, but he could find nothing. He returned home and slept fitfully. Just after 9 a.m., I was handed the first dispatches. I read them, and I could not move. I read them again, and I ran into the street. There was Chief Beck. I quickly told him of the tragedy. His face was white and silent. My hand shook. Then he told me of his strange morning and headed into the third ward as the terrible news was spread. I tried to thank the boy who pulled me ashore, but he dove back into the water. I stood there, shivering. I looked to my left and saw a row of bodies. I looked away and saw more. Eliza, halfway down the row, her hair and the dress and her fingers stiff and clutching and her face. I couldn't look anymore. The events of that morning and the next days have been recounted in print across the country. An exhausted victim climbs up the steep clay bank, but too weak falls back into the surf. Bodies on the bluff being pilfered by thieves even as students dive into the surf to save the drowning. Eliza, at the last minute she didn't want to go, but her mother insisted because we were all going. The government lifeboat from Chicago drags the bar with a grappling hook after the surf goes down. Mary and Mrs. Tevlin, the Cody sisters, John Horan, Andy Monahan, everyone. Almost everyone. The best day of my life. God's mercy on us all. Bodies conveyed to an old office in the courthouse in Chicago. The coroner does what he can to identify each and by arrangement at $5 a head. Each is put into a coffin and conveyed to the train to be shipped to a destination. I came back to Milwaukee on the train. A man finds his dead wife. Another man asks if he would like a photograph for remembrance, a modest price. The camera is set on its long legs, staring down at the still face on the floor. A plate is pulled from a chamber for a few seconds and replaced. Money and names are exchanged, and the camera moves on to its next client. I washed up in Kenosha. I was hoping to float back to the third ward, but I got bogged down. They brought me back by train, and John Rossiter picked me out by my belt. He knew where I'd cut my name on the inside of it, James Michael O'Brien. And they laid me on a table and tied a little gray tag to my wrist. An aged man walks the lakeshore hapless and coatless, sure that the deep will give up its dead. A woman in the third ward sits on the street with her face in her hands and weeps for her children. She will not be comforted because they were not. Bells tolled, and there was a lovely mass at St. John's for Peter Riley, Bloss Lynch, and me. And they buried us together up on the hill. So that was good company. I'd like to have waited for Captain Barry, but he was among the last men home. I wouldn't have kept. We made Chicago by mid-morning. A tugboat towed us to the river docks, and a man there told us the news. Noble acts, generosity and kindness next to venality and hucksterism, by turns ugly and sublime. That is America. We were placed in custody for our own protection. An angry mob had gathered on the docks. There were rumors that we'd been sailing with no light, that it was sabotage, a Republican plot against the Irish. The papers called Captain Mallet a British spy and an agent of the Southern planters. That afternoon, the inquest began, and we stood before the county coroner and a jury of 12. Budge had no answer for why he waited so long to get Captain Mallet. 
And he and Vorce admitted that they knew the Augusta is hard to control when she's overloaded, but they never told the captain. But Mallet's testimony was calm and clear. He told the truth. I told them what I knew. I was at the wheel. I kept to the course I was given. And when I tried to pull her up, she wouldn't move. It was an accident. They say a hundred children have no parents. The whole city is draped in black. Shops are closed up and down Water Street. The third ward school is closed. The teachers have drowned. They interviewed survivors from the Elgin who'd seen our light. And three other ships were nearly capsized in the squalls. The schooner St. Mary went down with all hands. It was an accident. One kindness. Father Donahue has received a donation that will pay for a mass to commemorate the victims every year on the 8th of September until the world shall come to an end. On the 9th of September, the jury published its findings. The Elgin's officers were censured for having too many passengers. Captain Mallet was censured for not coming to anchor, even though the steamer was gone. But the blame was placed on the weather. No charges were filed. Still, there were threats to burn the Augusta, so the owners painted her black and renamed her and sent her away. Without any of us, of course, we scattered. Captain Mallet went home to his wife in Canada, and I went home to my father's. So what is the tally? We count the numbers as if they could measure the loss. 116 known survivors, nearly 300 confirmed lost, and many still unaccounted for. The passenger rolls are lost. Five minutes, and we'd have missed her. Or a change of wind, or if we'd changed course half a degree. But how can you blame anyone? Who do you blame? How do we go on now? Will the Irish here ever be the same? I think about Garrett Barry and the days going forward without us now. Doesn't seem fair, but then nothing ever was. But what will become of this home we tried to build in this new country and came to love so much and died for? I suppose that's not for us to answer. November 11th, 1860. It rained today, just rain. Captain Barry and his son have been laid to rest and we have a new president. This entry ends my journal. Tomorrow, remembering Eliza, I'll purchase another. I'm getting a room of my own next week. Kate Butler and I are taking a small flat in the ward she works at the hotel on Main and Mason, so I'm only a block away. We always got on. We're Irish. We'll do. Captain Berry believed in this republic and a freedom that was worth fighting and dying for. But that day in Chicago, that day is connected like a chain through Randall and Booth to Joshua Glover and his struggle for liberty. The irony is that Garrett Berry and Joshua Glover were fighting for the same thing, but didn't know it. I went to Winnetka, where so many had drowned in the breakers. The shore was still littered. It rained as I left. That morning, on the beach, in the rain with the dead, I put my hands in the coat pockets to warm them. In one pocket, there was a little pair of shoes that Mr. Horan had purchased in Chicago for his daughter. I delivered them. I don't want to be on the water now. Not for a while. But I don't feel at peace ashore. I can't sleep. I listen to my father's sermons and the men in the street. I read the papers and I feel such a sense of dread as if we're all hurtling out of control. I mean, our country. 
And perhaps my father's right. Perhaps another bargain with slavery is another deal with the devil. But is war less evil than slavery? I don't know. I don't know what to believe. Mr. Lincoln is to be president. So Governor Randall will not have to lead Wisconsin out of the Union. But now the southern states redouble their talk of rebellion. Mr. Lincoln vows to hold the nation together. That task may be his measure. And some say it was just a waste, that terrible day of September the 8th. And sure, I thought it was an awful shame. But only a waste? I mean, I had plans, you know. But anyway, how can you measure the worth of a life? By a man's accomplishments? By the burdens he carried? Or maybe how he's remembered? I've come to believe the true measure is loyalty. Look at what a man fights hardest for, and whether he's willing to die for it. If he is, and if he does, then I know this. That's not a life that's wasted. I think too many of us Germans have not protested slavery strongly enough because we were worried about ourselves. I think that's true of Garrett Barry and the Irish as well. Governor Randall wronged the Irish, and he is an ambitious politician with a heart to match, but he has been right about slavery. We must now ask if being right is good cause to do wrong, to defy the law, and shed blood. That hard question will not go away, I think, and we will be forced to answer it with more than our words. What we do here is larger than our ward, our city, our state. We are Americans now, and the country is split wide. The collision between North and South, slave and free, between states' rights and the preservation of our republic lies just ahead. The result will measure us all. That is my story. Domsky won't print it, but someone will. It's a free country. There's a day in spring when the harbors have finally thawed and the season opens. If you've never seen it in a port like Green Bay or Milwaukee, you've missed a sight. The first ship hoists her sails with a shout and leads the way. Another follows and another until there are 50 or even 100 schooners all scattering like a flock of white gulls on a rising wind. They look so unafraid and free. I hope someday to feel that way again. I think that uh, the essence of the tragedy was captured quite well. As well, my, my, uh, the character that I most enjoyed was Fritz Haas, the reporter for the Milwaukee Atlas. Um, not so much you know, Fritz, but his boss, Bernhard Domsky. And uh, uh, I, could see, I don't know if that was fact where Domsky 
sent this reporter to cover the funeral. But I know, I feel confident that he would never have covered it, that someone, there was that much animosity between uh, uh, Domsky and Barry uh, over the whole question of, and I think partisan politics more than anything else. I had spent several years researching uh, the passenger list of the Lady Elgin. So I was dealing with a lot of direct records, probate records, and church death records, and burial records, and a wide variety of sources. So when uh, Morgan and Kishline came up with this play, I, I thought it was just wonderful because it gave life to something that I had been working on for so long and really was a very dry subject. And so I thought it was wonderful. I thought their, their choice of using uh, Fritz to provide the background throughout the play was very interesting. I thought using uh, the fellow from the Augusta to give the Augusta viewpoint was interesting. And then, of course, Ellen and O'Brien gave the Irish viewpoint. So I thought it was a wonderful play. Young O'Brien, uh, I think, saw, uh, as is written, uh, that one of his ladders to success would be to be a member of the Union Guards. It was uh, a fraternal uh, organization that had uh, uh, impacted one's life beyond just preparing for, you know, uh, uh, martial activities. You know, your business contacts and you know, uh, place in society was uh, uh, at least in part uh, recognized by your by the unit that you were with. Barry is not somebody who you hear or see a great deal in print, other than his election as uh, county treasurer, and that was the, the you know in 1860, uh, you don't see him involved in third ward politics. Haven't haven't found him to be all right. His uh, uh, he had some successful business concerns, partnerships, uh, and then again uh, you see him uh, run as a county treasurer, and uh, it was. Uh, announcing his victory, it was it was made known that he ran his own campaign owing to no one, and he ran as an independent. One of the victims was a, a minister of parliament in England. He was touring the United States. So uh, it was front page news in, a, in the London papers. It was front page news in every paper in this country. Frank Le Leslie's Illustrated did a big spread on it. Uh, it was news. It was news in New York, it was news in Boston, uh, a lot of coverage in Chicago, all right? And, and yet, um, more of the disaster itself. And at one point, there was legislation entered in Madison to secede, for Wisconsin to secede from the Union and declare war on the United States. That's where this whole thing started, and Randall, uh, supposedly checked with many of the militia com companies around the state and said, will you stick with the U.S. or will you stick with Wisconsin? And of course the Union Guard were Democrats, Randall was a Republican. I suspect that's why he picked on the Union Guard. Um, but uh, Garrett Berry said no, he would not be a traitor, he was not going to go against the United States. Um, he was a graduate of West Point, his men were all Irish. Many of them had sworn allegiance to the United States and they weren't going to go back against that. When Randall and Adjutant General Swain uh, perceive that they can't uh, uh, perhaps count on Barry if this ever comes down, and it never comes close, uh, they revoke uh, Barry's uh, commission, but also uh, take back the arms that were uh, allotted by the state to militia units, namely the Union Guards. So the Lady Allison excursion was a fundraiser to help pay for those arms. They did get the arms in June, and so they were able to take them down to Chicago with them for their parading down there. There's a lot of young people, uh, men and women on, that, uh, on the Lady Elgin, that uh, really were going to take advantage of this excursion. Uh, this was more or less like a party, you know, like something you might find in, a, in a Water Street on a Friday night. Uh, so they were very anxious to get down there and have a good time. They sat on the Dousman dock for about five hours waiting for the Lady Elgin. Um, it had been expected around six on Thursday evening. It didn't come in until about midnight. Um, and then, of course, they went down to Chicago. Many of them partied all the way down to Chicago, never slept at all. 
Uh, and when they got to Chicago, they went, many of them went their own ways, had a variety of activities. Lady Elgin was the luxury steamship on the Great Lakes. I mean, that was a, a major portion of the attraction also. You know, this was something that they all wanted to see, they wanted to be on. It was very tastefully appointed, it was very expensive. It was, it was a luxury steamship. Most everyone had a good time in Chicago during the day. The, uh, the Union Guards uh, met with and were welcomed by Irish militia units in Chicago. Uh, there were a number of different things to do. When it left Chicago, I think it left Chicago about midnight, and in two hours it had made its way north as far as Winnetka. There was a huge storm that night from the northeast, so the wind was blowing over Lake Michigan at almost its total length. There was articles in the paper next day about trees being uprooted in Milwaukee and about fences being knocked down. It was just a huge storm. Uh, based on the wind speeds and the the uh, amount of time it went on Lake Michigan, the waves were probably close to 20 feet high. You know, the fact that the, the prow of the Augusta went into the steam wheel of the, the wheel of the Lady Elgin meant that it had to be coming down at this angle. So the waves were very high. I'm sure visibility was near zero. You hear about somebody who floated in on a drum and others who were sitting on the back of cattle that were on it and pieces of wood and um, just anything that they could. And many of them made it to shore. Hundreds of them made it to shore, almost to shore. And then the huge waves prevented them from making it all the way to shore. Bodies were recovered. There was a body recovered a year later, identified by a ring that the family hadn't told about, it was on this, Ellen Williams. So they were, they were recovering bodies for weeks and months, and as they say, up to a year later. 302 victims uh, I have found documentation for, 97 survivors, so that's 399. The official inquiry said there was about 400 people on the boat and about 300 of them drowned, so these figures seem like they're pretty accurate. There were 300 victims on the Lady Elgin. 80% of, the, of them were from Milwaukee and 60% of them were Irish. So about 180 Irish people lost their lives. Milwaukee Irish people lost their lives on the Lady Elgin. So it affected virtually every Irish person. Some, some member of their family, or their extended family, or their friends, everybody was affected by it. Every Irish person was affected to some extent by it. An early author says that the Wisconsin's Irish community was on its way to being, you know, the the, the political domination of dominance of, uh, in political dominance of Milwaukee. That just doesn't bear the facts. Number one, the numbers as far as uh, you know, albeit a tragedy and a, a horrible tragedy. The fact is that the community was not. Uh, 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 decimated. In fact, we elect an Irish mayor in uh, 1863, and uh, the ward uh, never changes its political status. Uh, probably more of a factor to destroying the, the, the Irish as a political community will be a fire that rages in the Third Ward in 1892.